This is Dr. Charles Parker, and you're listening to Core Brain Journal. It's a place where I connect both fresh discoveries and interesting different perspectives from advanced mind science with the realities of real people and everyday life down on Main Street. Well, welcome, folks. Here we are one more time, Dr. Charles Parker and... We have a very interesting guest who's going to talk to us about addictions on many, many interesting levels. Uh, Dr. Tony Mealy, he's out in uh, Sovereign Health in California. And Tony, welcome. We're looking forward to talking to you. Great. Thank you, Chuck. My pleasure. It's good to be here. So what we're going to talk about, first of all, is who Tony is, and then we'll go from there. He's a licensed psychologist from Philadelphia, my old hometown and brings 25 years of clinical and senior management experience on both the payer and provider sides of behavioral health. In his various roles, Dr. Mealy oversees the integration of neurobiology and traditional psychotherapy to treat co-occurring addictive disorders. Of particular interest to Dr. Mealy are creating interventions that are based on the cognitive substrates of DBT, which we're going to talk about that in a minute, and motivational interviewing, which we'll also be talking about. Very interesting topics. We haven't hit them in Core Brain Journal, and uh, Dr. Mealy knows a lot about them. So with that brief introduction, Dr. Mealy, tell us a little bit about what you do out there and your give us a little window into your per- personal life, if you will. Sure, great. Thanks so much. Uh, it's, it's really good to, uh, to join you and your audience, Chuck. Uh, as you said, I'm a licensed psychologist. I'm actually new to uh, Southern California. I uh, was invited to join uh, Sovereign about a year ago as chief clinical officer. Um, and in that role, uh, I really play, um, I guess I wear two hats. One is uh, I, I have the great fortune uh, to make sure that all of the clinical programming that Sovereign presents to its patients um, is research-based, evidence-based, and we've done a a lot of really uh, exciting programming around addiction, recovery, sobriety, uh, by superimposing some rather, um, uh, I guess, stalwart theorists like um, Carl Rogers. Carl Rogers, you broke up right there. Yeah. So say that yeah. again. You broke up right yeah. at Carl Carl Rogers. Uh, uh, Carl Rogers. Uh, okay. Um, so we, we what we've done is we've taken such stalwart theorists as Carl Rogers, um, Maslow, Eric Erickson, and superimposed their theoretical constructs on recovery. Uh, so it's been really exciting to be able to ensure that what we present to uh, to the community to and to our patients is um, evidence-based and um, um, you know uh, research-based. And in, in my second role is um, really as a spokesperson for the sovereign way uh, of treating addiction, which is based on our belief that the brain is a, um, a, a dynamic entity rather than uh, you know stable and uh, non uh, non evolving. We believe that the brain's ability to heal itself is um, kind of the, the the basis for a recovery from addiction, maintenance of sobriety, as well as recovery from mental health conditions. So I have a really exciting role. Uh, I get to present that um, you know uh, in different media venues as well as uh, in presentations around the country. Um, but if if I can if I can share uh, what what I find most exciting, Chuck, is that it has really taken me taken me uh, twenty some years to get to this point. Mm-hmm. Um, when I go back to to my own history, my dissertation, uh, we studied children who had been born uh, exposed to cocaine uh, during their their, their gestation. And we looked at these children, um, they detoxed with a, a cocaine addiction. And this was during the late 80s and 90s when we had the crack epidemic sweeping a lot of the uh, urban settings. And in my, um, the piece of the, the research that I was fortunate enough to participate in, we studied these children when they hit um, Head Start classrooms. 
And what we were looking to see was, um, just as there had been a, um, a fetal cocaine, uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, excuse me, we were asking the question, would there also be a fetal cocaine syndrome where children who had been exposed to cocaine would present with a fairly predictable set of cognitive, emotional, social, psychological uh, sequelae. We were um, pleased to find out that um, those children who were removed from a drug-seeking environment went to Head Start classrooms but were living with grandparents, other family members, uh, even social services. Those kids were doing fairly well. They were um, maybe a little bit delayed, but basically indistinguishable from their non-exposed peers. However, those kids that um, remained in a drug-seeking environment, they were faring much more poorly. So we, were, we concluded that there probably wasn't a fetal cocaine syndrome in a classic sense of syndrome, but um, most importantly, we began to understand the role of the environment in helping to shape um, human behavior. Now, you, you know, that was back in the 90s, so fast forward 23 years, we probably would, would see that as the role of the environment in what we would call pruning uh, or shaping uh, the neuron, uh, you know, experience uh, the, the neur at a neuronal level. So it was really exciting. It gave a lot of hope that uh, these kids would not be stigmatized. They weren't sentenced to a life of cognitive impairment uh, or social emotional maladjustment. Um, it was it was very exciting, Chuck. Well, it sounds interesting because. Uh, it's really quite in line with what everybody's talking about nowadays in terms of epigenetics. And uh, I mean, one of the works uh, that I, people that I follow a great deal is uh, uh, Dr. Bill Walsh outside of Chicago, who's mm -hmm. talking about epi epigenetic change and neurotransmission. Mm -hmm. And he gets down on a molecular and cellular level. We've had several interviews with him here. And uh, it's, it's really right along the same path. And I think it's so very excellent that you're doing it with addictions because addictions have been kind of Johnny come lately to the recovery process from a neurophysiologic point of view. I, I, absolutely. I, I think for, for us, is, you know, as a, um, you know, mainstream, um, you know, recovery program and company, m most of us are trained to treat um, addiction uh, as a system disease. We, we've kind of gotten to that point. We're starting to understand it as a disease. Um, I think that because many of us who are, who are either uh, non-physician clinicians, we often come from an attachment theory, a self-medicating theory of, uh, of, of addiction. And I think that there's some room for that because I think what, what neuroplasticity has to say to us is that the environment does play a role in how the brain processes uh, stimulation, stimuli. And you know, we're, we're seeing that, so we, what we do is we take a developmental approach. We do understand that the early childhood experiences are continuing to you know, um, evolve and influence the brain. They did influence the brain, they continue to do so. And because not everybody with a, a challenging childhood history becomes an addict, there clearly are other factors at play. Um, when they get to us, when a patient gets to us, what we try to do is look at how are they processing, you know, a, a stimuli, a trigger. And this is, this is, you know, radically different because if you look at treatment, addiction treatment, you know, what the, the mainstay has been avoid people, places, and things. Mm -hmm. right? yes. Avoid your triggers. Yeah, avoid the triggers. Well, how can Absolutely. you do that? How can how can you do that? How, you know, can, you, how, can, how you can you avoid them and understand them at the same time? Absolutely, excellent point. I mean, yeah, I mean that, that's going to make you that's going to frustrate everybody. You know, if you, if you're if you're an alcoholic in you know in a urban setting, you know the chances are you're going to be running across a bar rather frequently. Okay, so we 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 got to get away from. Um, you know, the, this whole avoidance thing. And instead, what we need to do at a, at a neuronal level is help folks process the trigger differently, train the brain to process differently so that if, 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 if a 
two people, an alcoholic and a non, you know, a non-alcoholic, are presented with a can of beer. The excitatory neurons in both, you know, function similarly. That's the goal. That the alcoholic doesn't have, you know, this response, this synaptical response that propels, you know, an impulse control problem. Okay, mm-hmm. so we're really trying to do two things in in our treatment, and you know, this is very, very new. You know, very, very new. We're trying to look at what are the cognitive processes that underlie um, an addiction. Okay, it's difficulty shifting attention. All right, that's the obsession, and it's difficulty delaying an impulse. That's the compulsion. So we're trying to look at you know, this in somewhat classic terms, obsessive compulsive, but how do we get to the cognitive functioning, the brain functioning that underlies that? So that that's kind of where we're at right now. Very interesting. Now, uh, so then what is your program like? If that, that sounds, uh, I'm sure some of our listeners are thinking, oh my gosh, it's way over my head. How could I possibly get involved with something like that? So if you could give us a couple of pictures, a little bit of an idea of how a human being coming into a facility would be evaluated and treated in regards to what you were just saying? Sure, sure. Um, well, there, there's a couple of different strategies that, that we use. One is certainly, there's a whole education that has to occur, okay? And so we, we go into, you know, what, when we say that addiction is a disease, what are we really saying? Because that's kind of like a buzz phrase now. Yes, Everybody is. knows that they're supposed to say that, so they all yeah. say it. Yeah. But when we start to explain, you know, what is neuroanatomy at a very, you know, at an understandable level to uh, to the patients? Okay, this is what your brain is doing. This is how, you know, you are um, responding to a, a trigger. We are in the process of modifying how we use neurofeedback to help, you know, give a, a picture uh, you know of that uh, of the brain response. Then there are two other things that, well, that stop were, right there. Let were, me interrupt you because that's yeah. you, you tweak my interest. Too. So in that, yeah. before we move on to the next one, it's uh, neurofeedback is a uh, serious interest that we have. And do you does that mean that you do a QEEG on the front end to to really right. understand um, uh, the foundation, the neuro, the um, brain brain foundation? Right, and think think of neurofeedback in two ways. You, exactly what you just said, that gives us the baseline. And then think of it as an ongoing measurement-based tool, okay? So it's giving you feedback as to the efficacy, as, as to the results, how well your, uh, your treatment is doing, as well as helping to be the intervention itself. Yes. So it's kind of serving two functions. Um, in, in, in addition to that, there, there's we have uh, Sovereign um, through our um, our leadership team has developed what we call neurobics, like kind of like aerobics, but we call them neurobics, <laughs> and it's a, a proprietary set of games that we are testing uh, applications, uh, computer applications that are designed to. Uh, it's, it's it's really really cool. They're designed to address the cognitive deficits that appear from a standardized psychological battery. So this is really neat. What it at Sovereign are dedicated to a cognitive and emotional evaluation. It's probably more robust than most folks are even, um, you know, have the capacity to do because we have a whole uh, cadre of licensed psychologists and psychiatrists who are administering these and interpreting these tests. So let's say you and I both take um, an MMPI and, you know, a personality test like the MMPI and perhaps a Connors for, uh, you know, attention deficit. And we, we start to look at what does Chuck's profile look like? What does Tony's profile look like? And that, that allows us to individualize the treatment. So let's say you score high on um, an impulse control control problem, I score high on a depression. Then what we do is we can take those two data points, your impulse control, my depression, and we can take um, these neurobic games to try to change the brain's perception, perceiving a stimuli, interpreting a stimuli, and acting on a stimuli that's either depressive or impulse control related. It's it's really it's it, it's starting to tie in 
the cognitive and emotional presentation to the addiction at, at a very basic level. So it's so that, self-management that, on, a, on a neurologic level. It, it really is. It's self-awareness on a, on a neurologic level. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I will tell you, the, the other thing that, that we're starting to do, and I haven't finished this, but this is where I think I, I want to go next, is I've been working with uh, our, our CEO on this, uh, and we have a chief scientific officer, uh, Dr. Sharma, is our uh, CEO and Dr. Kamari is our chief scientific officer. And what we're starting to look at is um, what are the cognitive substrates that are required for DBT and uh, motivational interviewing? Because if you, you know, when I go around and I ask people, are you using uh, motivational interviewing as a technique? Are you using DBT? Of course, everybody raises their hand because it's the latest bat to hit. Um, you know, uh, our industry. And, and there's a lot of efficacy, but the problem is it's all cognitive based. And if you have a person who's been uh, drug seeking or drug using or alcohol using for 10, 12, 15, 20 years, their cognitive functioning clearly has been impacted. Yet you're going at them with a treatment that's all cognitive. So, we, we have folks whose who's, you know, subcortical functioning is impaired, yet we're going to give them a, we're going to use a tool such as motivational interviewing, which requires them to do sequential organization, uh, you know, planning, consequential thinking, many of which are, are, are tasks that their, their, their alcoholism or their drug addiction has, has impaired. So we're trying to get to how do we kind of re, um, retool DBT and MI, which we know intuitively are valuable to meet the specific uh, cognitive capacity of the patient in front of us. Well, that's so great. Let me interrupt exciting. you again because now I'm, I'm listening with our listeners here and I'm thinking about uh, some, some deficits that they're going to have in terms of the communication with, with us now. One of the things, sure. folks out there, cognitive has to do with thinking. It's a buzzword we yes. use all the time. You know, Tony and I are happy to use it. We use cognitive and uh, <laughs> uh, without thinking. But thinking is what cognition is about as opposed to feeling and behavior. Uh, feeling and behavior are two other brain activities, but cognition, and when he was talking about subcortical and cortical, cortical, generally speaking, has to do more with the cognitive side, and subcortical has to do more with affect, emotion, and what's going on with uh, feelings, how you affect an emotion may not, you know, be out of whack on some level uh, where a person's stuck with trauma or something. And then, so there's, what, what Tony's really talking about is connecting these two in some operational terms so that it would really help a person with self-management. Now, Tony, you also talked about something else there. I want, please share what these terms are because I know a lot of our audience don't have any idea when you're talking about DBT, dialectical behavioral sure. therapy. And let's take a moment on that and then on motivational interviewing, MI, please. Sure, sure, thank you. I appreciate the uh, clarification. Um, DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy, um, is a technique developed by uh, Marshall Linehan uh, to help folks who have a hard time managing keeping their emotions under control. These are uh, individuals who go from zero to 60 on the emotional uh, speedometer very, very quickly. They're, they get easily aroused, easily upset, and their level of, of upset often can look uh, more extreme than the situation uh, might, might warrant. So what... Um, this technique does, it's, it's called dialectical because it means uh, there are two poles, that's dialectical, two poles. Mm -hmm. The one pole is the therapist accepting the reality of the patient, and the other pole is to get the patient to acknowledge a need for change, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's accept, but it's not approving. It's accepting and helping Okay, so obviously... Uh, just a second, stop there right there. Are, you, you cut out, yep. and it was an imp important phrase. Accept and helping, and you broke out right there. Helping. Okay, and helping the, 
helping the patient acknowledge the need for a change. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Helping the patient see that yes, their 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 emotional state is valid. Okay. We don't judge it. We don't condemn it. But we also try to help them see how is that emotional reaction uh, helping you. And what can you do about it? Respond to the same stimulation that got them upset. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's the that's and there are, there are a series of um, there are a series of techniques that motivation. I'm sorry, the dialectical behavioral therapy will use. And the very one of the very first ones is, and you you I, I'm sure this is probably another buzzword out there, is this technique called mindfulness. Mm-hmm. Mindfulness, and what mindfulness is. It's uh, sometimes people think it's it's meditation and, and it's not meditation. Mindfulness is to the ability to sit, to stay in the present moment with the very emotion that you otherwise might try to run away from. Okay, and so oftentimes we try to help individuals in the therapy simply sit with the feeling of frustration, if that's what they're feeling, or anger, or resentment, okay, rather than have the, allow the patient to act out and escalate emotionally and get upset. We try to help them tolerate that. That's a big part of, of DBT, okay? And so, again, the, the ability, think about that, the ability to stay with a distressful or upsetting emotion. How much cognition goes into that? Okay, the ability to tolerate frustration. Well, it's certainly uh, the frustration is an emotional response. The cognition of being able to stay put, not wander, not move, hold your impulse. Okay, not act out. Those are all cognitive skills. So it really is bridging. I think you, you, know, you said this a couple minutes ago, Chuck. It is really connecting the emotional and the behavioral. And it's, 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 it's a, a wonderful technique. However, not everybody with a 20 year history of alcoholism, you know, their cognition is not always going to be intact enough to be able to tolerate that. So we have to do this in very small pieces. And one of the things that we do in the therapy, and I, and I, I don't know where the research is on this, but I, I, I suspect there's, there's a wealth of opportunity here. The, the transaction between the patient and the therapist, okay, the dialogue, ha, you know, the, I suspect because dialogue and communication is cognitive as well as emotion, emotional, that that is an important part of how we can help remediate the, the addiction in, in, in talk therapy. Um, and I think we, we haven't really tapped into how we can do that. And I think that's where motivational interviewing comes in. Motivational interviewing acknowledges that that communication between the therapist and the patient is having a brain, a neuronal, a neural uh, effect that is changing the brain based on the communication pattern. All right, so that's the mo- and motivational interviewing is another series of activities that's designed to have the patient develop some level of insight into how they would benefit from changing their behavior. So think about that. One of the big techniques in motivational interviewing is help. You cut out right there on the word helping. One of the one of the primary goals or, or techniques of motivational interviewing is to help a patient envision how their life could be different. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So think about the cognitive requirements. You know, you and I might sit back, and many of in our audience might sit back and and fantasize about how life could be different, mm-hmm. and maybe even take steps. I can do this, and then I can do that and then I can do that, and you know, start doing some sequential planning and do the pros and cons of each of those steps. Well, that requires a certain level of cognitive functioning. And what we're looking at doing in, at Sovereign is saying, what are the steps, that e- the cognitive requirements, each step along the way 
what is underpinning motivational interviewing from a cognitive uh, thinking um, uh, analysis? And I, I think if we can really get to that, we're going to make a great contribution to uh, to recovery. Uh, absolutely. Well, you know, it's an interesting thing. As you're talking, I'm imagining the many years of my own work in, in recovery activities and, and uh, you know, ran a hospital unit for a long period of time and and I wrote that book, Deep Recovery, back in 92. But, the, you know, my experience there is it was always so negative uh, with the people in, in terms of uh, looking in contrast to what you're saying into the past and what was wrong here and what was wrong there. But it's what you're talking about is a creative, imaginative, forward thinking, where will we go and how are we going to get there uh, kind of approach as opposed to, you know, you really screwed up here and you screwed up there. Now, what are you going to do about it? Uh, and gives, it gives I, yeah, you know, it's that. Go ahead, please. It, it's that. What is that? That. Um, you know, there's a manuscript out there. Uh, it, may, it may actually be a book. You know, you're not stuck with the brain you were born with. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and it, it's you know, it's the same idea. You know, we sure we all have past histories, and it, you know, one of one of one of the I, I think one of the contributions that that's being made. I, I, I think it's I think there's some issues, but I think a lot of uh, Dr. Matei's work is acknowledging that our past. I mean, we can't deny it. You know, our past has contributed to who we are today, you know, positively and negatively. All right, so how do we how do we understand its role? At, 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 and for us, not a, at a purely psychodynamic perspective, but how do we understand its role in our brain development? And how do we work with that? Yes. We're, we're not we're not a slave to it, yes. but we can't ignore the, that it's there. And how can we you use know, it to past, look forward? Yeah. I mean, the issue Absolutely. is. I think this is what you're saying that's so, uh, in in fact, in itself, imaginative and interesting because you're saying, okay, the past is the past, but what, I mean, I'm going to break it down almost too simplistically, but how can we learn from it and what can we use in that learning process to do what we're going to do next? I, I, absolutely. I mean, it, you know, we have to it, you know embrace it as a tool to move forward, uh, you know, otherwise... You know, otherwise we, we really run the risk of, of, of being very disconnected. And um, I, I, I would think that for addicts to be disconnected is probably not, for any of us really, <laughs> to be disconnected is, is, is not a good thing. So, well, Tony, um, our time that, is winding down here. I want to ask you oh, another wow, couple okay. quick questions and, and help. Sure. I mean, we could talk for an hour here very easily, and I'm, I'm sorry to cut <laughs> you off because this is such no, no, an no interesting problem. conversation. But tell us a little more for the listeners who are saying, hey, these folks are on the right track. Uh, number one, how do I get a hold of them? But I should say that. Number two, how do I get a hold of them? Number one is what does a treatment program usually consist of? Is it a certain period of time? Is it the old 30-day? Is it six months? What, what do you actually do with the treatment program? And then how can we get a hold of you? Sure, sure. Um, well, I definitely appreciate that. Um, the way we, you know, treatment is highly individualized. And so based on the, uh, the evaluation that we conduct and based, based on the, uh, the patient's presentation, uh, that will drive the length of stay if they enter uh, at a detox level and they have a fairly, um, you know, uh, benign detox, you know, rather standard detox, and move into the the different levels of therapy. You know, it can be a a 45 uh, to 60 day, um, you know, process. Mm -hmm. We do do, uh, we do have a a robust uh, e-therapy program. Um, So the folks who want to maintain contact with us at, at discharge, upon discharge, and they move far away, we can, you know, hook them up to a, uh, a Skype therapy, secure Skype therapy. We, uh, Chuck, we are in uh, nine locations across the U.S. with uh, plans to open up four more actually within the next six weeks. We're in different licensure stages. Um, uh, in a fairly, um, you know, a large presence across the U.S. And um, again, depending upon what their what the patient's um, needs are, you know, that will really dictate their the length of stay. Um, yeah. Well, that's so interesting. Now, I give mean, us a, a, yeah. a link so we can we can uh, 
pop in there. I'll have it included in the show notes, but if you could say it out for those who happen to be driving sure. to work, that'd sure. be great. Sure. The, um, I can give you the, the 24-7 uh, admissions uh, number is 866-594-5555. Okay. So that's 866-594-3271. And our uh, you know, website is uh, www.sovcal, S-O-V-C-A-L.com. Okay, I'm glad we clarified that because I would have been dialing up Sovereign. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> Tony, really this has been too short a conversation. <laughs> We've got to talk some more. This has been very, very interesting. Uh, I appreciate you coming on board with this, and it's really an innovative, different way of thinking about how to move forward. I mean, it's really, as you said in the beginning, I don't know whether we said it on recording or whether we were talking about it beforehand, but it's a, it's an appreciation of neuroplasticity applied in a in a clinical way. I mean, we're you're actually saying, how do we grow these brain cells? How do we respect them? How do we take the pain that we've been in? somehow understand it, appreciate it, and manage it, but move forward from there. And uh, it's very innovative. It's, it's much different than, uh, you know, the old cathartic theory of mental health where you kind of run around and scream for a while and get it out of your system. <laughs> uh, it's much different from that. And I think there's a lot of hope out there as a result. So we're, we're really excited to be uh, at the transformative and at the vanguard uh, of, this, of this whole process and this whole uh, approach. So thank you, Chuck. Thank you so much for the opportunity thank to Thank you, Tony you Mealy. It's really audience. been great listening to you. Really appreciate your presentation and and our opportunity to talk together. We'll we'll do this again sometime. Appreciate it. Sounds great. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to Core Brain Journal. We're working every day behind the scenes to bring you reports that connect research benches with those street trenches. Here we share the complexity of mind science because, as you know, details really do matter. One of the most pervasive, misunderstood challenges is how commonplace medications, like those written for ADHD, are used so regularly without clear guidelines. If you think you'd like more specifics, take a minute to download my two-page PDF packed with video links and references on the absolute essentials of how to start ADHD medications. They're easily available at corebrainjournal.com forward slash start. Thanks for listening. Do connect and stay tuned. Together we can make a difference.